Welcome back. This lecture is one of the lectures regarding the biosphere. In this lecture, we are going to discuss the requirements for life and the origin of life on this planet. So let's get started. First off, let's define life. What is it? The short definition is that life is a highly organized chemical system capable of self-maintenance and self-replication, or reproduction. The long definition is that organisms are open systems that maintain homeostasis, are composed of cells, and have a life cycle. They have a metabolism, can grow and adapt to their environment, respond to stimuli, reproduce, and evolve. Life is actually very difficult to define precisely. For example, viruses are technically not alive because they are not self-replicating and do not have a metabolism, but they do have a lot of characteristics of living things like DNA and the ability to evolve. Here is a slide with the properties of life summarized. Life is highly organized and it is made of cells. Molecules make up cells, which make up tissues, which make up organs, which make up systems, which make up an organism. Metabolism is also important. Living organisms use energy and consume nutrients to maintain life and its activities. They also break down food and create waste products. The metabolisms of all the organisms on Earth are linked to each other and Earth's systems globally via Earth's atmosphere and oceans, those geophysical fluids we learned about. Living organisms also maintain homeostasis. This means they maintain stable conditions like body temperature. Negative feedbacks are involved in homeostasis. Growth and a life cycle are also important properties, as is reproduction or self-replication. Living organisms also have to respond to stimuli and adjust to the environment. And finally, all living organisms are capable of evolution. This is via DNA and RNA mutation and natural selection. Another important note is that life, as we know it, requires water, liquid water. Water is the universal solvent in which life's biochemical reactions take place. Water is one of the most fundamental requirements for habitability, and Earth had to become stable enough for liquid water to constantly be available in order for life to evolve. Life also needs a constant input of energy to maintain order and chemical disequilibrium with its environment. Life's molecules would not spontaneously exist outside of an organism. They're not stable, and many will quickly fall apart if left alone. The second law of thermodynamics says that spontaneous processes in nature always lead to increased entropy. Because of that, life needs a constant input of energy to fight against the second law of thermodynamics. This energy is provided almost exclusively by the sun for life on Earth today, but it's not completely exclusive to the sun, and there are entire ecosystems based around chemical energy. Now let's talk about what life is composed of. There are four main classes of compounds or molecules of life, sugars or carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. We will talk about each of these classes of compounds in a couple of slides. Life is carbon-based. Carbon is the most important chemical element serving as the chemical backbone of life's molecules and a building block of life. Carbon is able to form long chains and very complex large molecules of all sorts. Most carbon-containing compounds are organic compounds. There are exceptions such as carbon dioxide, carbonates, and some other compounds as well. Life on our planet is composed primarily of the following six elements. They form the major molecules of life. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Now let's talk about sugars and carbohydrates a little more, which are one of the four main classes of compounds that make up living organisms. Glucose and similar sugars store energy in chemical bonds. They consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. Glucose has the chemical formula of C6H12O6. It is produced by photosynthetic organisms like plants. The energy that the plant stores as chemical bonds is ultimately coming from the sun. Sugars can also form long chains called carbohydrates. Now let's talk about lipids. Fats are an important class of lipid. They store a lot of energy, more than double what carbs and proteins store. Again, the energy is stored in chemical bonds. They also provide structure for cell membranes. They contain mostly carbon and hydrogen, some oxygen, and some can contain nitrogen and phosphorus as well. Proteins are next up. Proteins are long chains of connected amino acids. Specific amino acids are determined by different DNA sequences. Proteins provide structure and function for life. Enzymes, which are a type of protein, control and speed up biochemical reactions. Glycine and alanine, 
pictured here, are examples of amino acids. Last up are nucleic acids, which can take the form of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, or ribonucleic acid, also known as RNA. DNA and RNA encode the genetic information of organisms, and they are the full instructions on how to build and run that organism. You may have heard of something called the central dogma of biology. This is the process by which the genetic instructions are utilized in a cell. It starts with DNA, which is like the dictionary. DNA is transcribed to RNA, specifically messenger RNA, but don't worry too much about that. RNA is like passing a note to a friend. It's a message. Then the RNA is translated into proteins, which carry out actions within a cell. All living organisms on this planet have DNA as their dictionary, but some viruses are only RNA-based, like the coronavirus. Additionally, RNA may have come first in the origin of life, but now we live in a DNA world. The link I provided explains the process of DNA becoming proteins if you want some more review on it. All living organisms are linked via trophic interactions, or food webs. Raw materials come from the environment, and primary producers, like plants, turn them into organic matter for other organisms. Then herbivores consume plants, these are primary consumers, and carnivores eat either herbivores or other carnivores, acting as secondary consumers or higher depending on what they're eating. This is all visualized in the trophic pyramid to the right. The trophic level tells you what an organism eats. They are typically the most primary producers because they have to support entire food webs. Then each trophic level is smaller than the one below it. Decomposers like microbes and fungi, which are part of the biosphere, recycle organic matter back into nutrients for primary producers. The systems on Earth are very important for recycling these wastes. Microbes and fungi are very important recyclers in the biosphere, but temperature, water, oxygen, and other factors affect microbes and fungi. Many gases and minerals are ultimately affected by plate tectonics and the lithosphere as well, so geofluids like water, air, magma, and so on help to connect the systems. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the forms that life takes and how it got started on Earth. There are two general forms of life on this planet, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are larger, with complex cellular structures such as membrane-bound organelles, DNA and chromosomes, and so on. They can be unicellular organisms, meaning they are microbes, they're just bigger microbes, but they can also be multicellular organisms, like plants or humans. Prokaryotes are bacteria and archaea. Prokaryotes are small with a simpler cellular structure, such as non-membrane-bound organelles, DNA that's not tightly bound in chromosomes, and so on. All are unicellular organisms, also known as microbes. Some may live in colonies or even biofilms, but they're still unicellular because their single cell is a completely self-supporting system. The first forms of life on the planet were prokaryotic microbes. Remember that prokaryotes are single-celled organisms with no nucleus or membrane-bound organelles. From that starting point, all other organisms eventually evolved. But microbial life was the only form of life on Earth for a very long period of time. You can see that pretty clearly from the timeline shown on the far right. The timeline of Earth is shown as though it is the face of a clock. You can see that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. There was no life for quite a while as the Earth system became stable. Then prokaryotes evolved, shown in yellow. After more than one and a half billion years, single-celled eukaryotes evolved. Remember, these are still microbes, they just have a nucleus and are a little bigger and more complex. From there, multicellular eukaryotes evolved. These were still simple at first, but eventually more and more complexity evolved. The diversification of animals and land plants all happened fairly recently on geologic timescales. Then the evolution of humans is just a tiny blip on this diagram. You might be wondering how we know when life evolved especially since microbes don't leave great fossils. Well, some cyanobacteria formed layered structures that left fossils. They're called stromatolites, and those are 3.5 billion years old. Fossilized stromatolites are pictured to the right. We can also look for evidence of life like graphite, which is a biogenic substance found in 3.7 billion year old rock. We have also seen possible biogenic carbon preserved in 4.1 billion year old zircon, so that yellow band may actually be a little bit longer than what is shown. Before a cellular organism could evolve, organic molecules like proteins and so on had to evolve. We've shown how this likely happened. 
This is outlined by the primordial soup hypothesis. Early Earth's chemistry was very different from today. There was no oxygen until oxygenic photosynthesis evolved, so there were only reduced gases, reduced iron, water, and so on. Simple inorganic molecules may have reacted with energy to form organic building blocks that could have accumulated in the oceans, making a primordial soup, so to speak. The building blocks could have combined in further reactions, forming larger molecules in pools or at the water's edge. An experiment in 1952 tested this by mimicking Earth's early atmosphere and introducing a spark, and they made amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, so making amino acids was the first step. Today, enzymes build polymers, meaning amino acids are made into bigger and bigger compounds. This is called biosynthesis, or anabolism. But monomers, like amino acids, may have spontaneously formed polymers under the conditions on early Earth as well. This may have happened in an evaporating tidal pool. In the 1950s, Sidney Fox heated amino acids in the absence of water, and they formed proteins. So water on early Earth could have boiled away and left proteins behind. This process may have also happened on a clay surface. In the 1990s, RNA nucleotides were linked together when exposed on a clay surface. The clay surface acted as a catalyst. So there are several options, and we aren't 100% sure how larger proteins first formed. So we've been talking about amino acids, proteins, and polymers, but that isn't life yet. So where do we think life evolved? Remember that early Earth's chemistry was very different from today. For a long time, there was no liquid water, and no life was possible until liquid water appeared. There was also no oxygen until prokaryotes evolved, oxygenic photosynthesis. There were only reduced gases, reduced iron, reduced sulfur, and so on. No oxygen also meant there was no ozone to protect terrestrial organisms from UV rays, since ozone is made from oxygen. Because there was no ozone layer, we know life did not evolve on land. Life probably did not evolve in seawater either, because salt water can split organic compounds. Darwin proposed that life began in a warm little pond, which may be the case. Life could also have evolved in deep sea vents. These occur in the ocean, but it isn't the same as evolving in the surrounding seawater of the ocean at large. Remember that deep sea vents are extremely hot with lots of chemicals and nutrients. There are also lots of minerals, some of which could stabilize organic compounds. We've actually found fossilized microbes in ancient hydrothermal vents, so this seems like it could be a likely place for life to have evolved. Their earliest life forms might have been based entirely on RNA as well. Today, every living organism follows the central dogma, DNA to RNA to protein. But some RNA molecules can store information, self-replicate, and perform catalytic functions. DNA would have eventually replaced RNA because it is more stable, but early life may have just followed the process of RNA to protein. It is also entirely possible that life did not evolve on Earth. It arrived on Earth. This is known as the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Meteorites may have brought organic molecules or living organisms to Earth from elsewhere, but they still had to form somewhere. There are several lines of evidence that make this hypothesis feasible. Some microbes have been found to survive better in the low gravity of space. Most bacteria that have been tested have similar growth rates to that on Earth. And some microbes have been found living on the outside of the space station in spite of microgravity, harsh UV radiation, and temperatures near absolute zero. Nonetheless, life still had to evolve somewhere. Today, all life falls within one of three domains. This is a very basic phylogeny, showing the evolutionary relationships of the three domains of life. We, as humans, fall within the domain eukarya, with all eukaryotes. Bacteria and archaea are the other two domains. Leuca, or the last universal common ancestor to all living organisms, was a prokaryote that lived around 4 billion years ago. The physiology and habitat of Leuca, based on genetic analysis of many, many organisms, was anaerobic, which means it needed absolutely 0% oxygen. It, it would be poisoned by any oxygen being present. It was also chemoautotrophic, which means it made its own food by harnessing em energy from chemicals. For comparison, photoautotrophs make their own food by harnessing the energy from the sun. It also lived in a geochemically active environment rich in hydrogen, CO2, and iron. Remember, this was all based on genetic analysis 
of a lot of living organisms. And finally, this organism, LUCA, was thermophilic, which means it liked hot environments. This all supports the hydrothermal vent hypothesis for the origin of life. I just want to take a minute to talk about microbes a little more since they are so important to the functioning of Earth and its systems. Microbial, or single-celled life forms, are still the dominant life form on our planet. There are 39 trillion microbes on a human body alone, and it's estimated that there are 500 million trillion trillion, or 5 times 10 to the 30th, microbes on Earth. Microbes exist on every possible habitat on Earth. They contain the most diversity of genes as well. These genes run the life-related parts of global elemental cycles. These are known as biogeochemical cycles, which are redox reactions that, when done by living organisms, are important aspects of that organism's metabolism. The graphic to the right shows some of the many biological parts of elemental cycling completed by different microbes. Many aspects of the carbon cycle are exclusively microbial. For the nitrogen cycle, all biotic parts are exclusively microbial. There's also a very active sulfur cycle, iron cycle, and many more. What I'm saying is that microbes are running the planet. Without microbes, multicellular life would not survive. Microbes also made the Earth habitable for other organisms in the first place. Eukaryotes and multicellular life couldn't evolve until prokaryotes started to produce oxygen via oxygenic photosynthesis. Today, microbes are still responsible for half of all photosynthesis on the planet. Oxygen is necessary for aerobic respiration, which we're all currently doing, the ozone layer, and for biogeochemical cycles to exist as they do today. Oxygen is a very strong oxidant, and so many chemical compounds for the different elements would not exist without it. That concludes the material. Let's go through and review the main points. Life is a complex, organized, biochemical system capable of self-regulation and maintenance, as well as replication. Life needs constant energy to maintain order and chemical disequilibrium against chaos. Life on Earth consists of four main classes of molecules, sugars or carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. DNA carries the genetic information for how to build an organism. Life uses raw materials and produces wastes. The Earth system recycles all these wastes and all life on Earth is linked together via Earth's systems, including geophysical fluids. There are many steps to the evolution of life. The origin of organic molecules, the origin of polymers, the origin of cellular functions, and we don't have a definite answer for the exact events, timing, or where it happened, but we do have a sense of the life history of LUCA. Microbial life has great genetic diversity and is the most abundant life form on the planet. Thus, microbes dominate the planet to this day, and they run biogeochemical processes and cycles. Microbial life also made the Earth habitable for multicellular life to evolve, and continue to make the Earth habitable. Thanks for sitting through the lecture. To test your learning, I suggest you review the material and make sure you can answer these questions.